Anywho, yeah, so last time we've been talking about movement of energy in streams, right? And this idea that you can have autochthonous production in the streams, but to be honest, more often than not, you're most interested in the allochthonous carbon, which is coming in The shredders think it looks sick. Okay. Um, well, let's see. It may just be the case that I have to minimize. Your microphone is not... Oh, did I pull my microphone out? Jeez, everything's just going sideways, as they say. Check my microphone. Testing my microphone. It works. All right. So, I think... Was it this... Looks like, looks like a robot. Like, hmm? okay. All right. Oh, why did that happen? Oh, because the. I think we're still working. Yes, we are. There's nothing more annoying for me. Well, there are things that are more annoying for me. Uh, war is more annoying. You know, inequality and racism. More. Lots of things more annoying. But one thing that annoys me is when I go to post the video on YouTube and realize that the microphone didn't work. Because when that happens, I get to record it again. So I'm glad my mic is working. What the heck was I talking about? Oh yeah, carbon. In particular, uh, sorry, so dissolved organic matter. So we talked about FPO. So really all of these size categories are, just have to do with how they're processed. Right. So, I mean, the, the reason that CPOM is talked about differently from FPOM is just because of how it's processed and how it's incorporated in the food web. Right. So we talked about dissolved organic matter. Uh, and again, the, the size breakdown is partly based on uh, the fraction that's too big, uh, too small for our filters to capture, but also the way that it's broken down and processed uh, in the stream is very different as well uh, because it can't be captured by filter feeders. So it has to find its way uh, into the food of another way. Uh, and that largely has to do uh, with, with microbes. Uh, but again, as we mentioned, a lot of that is refractory. So uh, it's not going to be incorporated easily into the food web. Again, OK. I think the twilight is on you guys. The question is, can I reach the smart board. Does the smart board want to be reached? Wasn't there? There's a little thing here earlier, right? Yeah. Okay. All right. There you go. Um, yeah. So so again, so we're talking about so with DLM, it's stuff that's that's smaller than half a micron. So just to review, then we've got these different pathways of energy. We've got the green food web, uh, our autochthonous. Uh, pathway over here, uh, allochthonous over here. But you can see, right, we've talked about CPOM and FPOM. And this is, a, this is a real stream food web, right? This is one that actually takes into account the fact that it's embedded in a terrestrial landscape. So, uh, you know, we've got our stream stuff, but especially if we're, uh, again, up in the headwaters, probably the stuff that comes in from the terrestrial ecosystem is going to be more important. So we've got leaf fall into here, it gets broken down by invertebrates fed on by fish. Those invertebrates, they emerge and fly away. They get pulled over by the police and their ID does not match what they look like at all anymore. Um, then they're consumed by these trusted things. So we've got all this stuff going on, but really, you know, y'all might have the opportunity like as middle schoolers or whatever else to go out and sample invertebrates in a stream. And uh, that's great. It's something you can easily see. But the fact is, we're just starting to learn more and more about in these food webs, the stuff you can't even see is pretty important too. So the microbes, as we talked about, right? So like this kind of a cartoon doesn't have uh, microbes anywhere in it, right? 
it's kind of cool. They've done studies. I think I mentioned to some of y'all that, and we'll talk about this later, but when trout invade some of these ecosystems and they reduce uh, the invertebrate abundance, it actually affects spider populations and lizard populations and everything because they don't have as much stuff coming out to be fed upon. So, um, so we're going to talk today about um, the microbial loop and invertebrate feeding rules. And uh, so some of those invertebrates that, uh, that we've seen and that you're familiar with, uh, so these are some of the grazers, heptogenia mayflies, we saw some of them, uh, water pennies, um, coleopteran, cephaneidae, we saw a couple of them. Uh, and then caddisflies, they kind of do their thing all throughout the food web, like mayflies as well. Uh, but some case building caddisflies, um, you know, kind of carry their case with them while they're, they're grazing. Um, so invertebrates are plugging in all, at all different levels in our food web. We have shredders, right? So they're going to be breaking down those leaves. Uh, we saw some tapulids, some crane fly larvae. Of course, we've seen crayfish, these peltoperlid um, uh, roach like stoneflies. There's mayflies that do it, amphipods, right? So these all plug into there. Uh, and then collectors as well. So further downstream, uh, so again, there are mayflies that um, are collectors. So these aren't filter feeders. When we talk about collecting macroinvertebrates, they can kind of get at their carbon one of two ways. They can either make a net to grab it, and that's what the hydrocycled caddisflies do. It's pretty cool. They can filter it out using these fans. So this is black fly larva, our star of the day. Um, and so they actually have these, these fans, these kind of filters on the side of their head. And they'll actually kind of sway back and forth in the stream using those to capture organic matter and feed on it. It actually be a really cool Halloween costume. If you can make like a helmet that had these fans coming off of it, and you could, I don't know, have like a sleeping bag or something. Well, it could be a black fly larva for Halloween. It'd be pretty cool. Because, you know, if you're a hydrocycled caddisfly for Halloween, you got to carry your net around with you. That's a pain. It's cool. That's perfect. I love it. If you get like stick them on it, be like, whoosh. of course, yeah, it, that could be fun. You might get hit in the face. But a helmet with a visor, and I love it. I love it. Whereas the beaded mayflies, they're more like, they're more like if they throw the candy at you and it lands on the ground and then the kids go and like collect it off the ground. That's what the beaded mayflies do. They just move through the, yeah, go with your friend who's a beaded mayfly. They'll get everything that doesn't get stuck in your fans. This is really interesting now. I'm going to have to, I've got that image in my head now. Uh, they may, the Halloween uh, costume shop out there by the mall and Tunnel Road, it's huge. They have every type of costume. I'm sure they have a black fly larva costume there somewhere. So these mayflies are going in the substrate, um, basically feeding on all the organic matter that hasn't been filtered out. So these are, these are collectors. Um, and so where are these dominating in the river continuum concept? Headwaters, middle reaches, or downstream? Thinking of the processing, right? So stuff is breaking down size-wise. And really they're in all three, but the area where they, where they dominate the most so downstream, based on the conceptual model, the idea is that you have collectors downstream. And these, those would include freshwater mussels because downstream you will have finer substrate. So it's a little harder to live, but um, you know, collectors as a whole will dominate more downstream. Okay, so where does the dissolved organic matter come in? Where does it come into this picture, you guys? Where does the dissolved organic matter? Where is it? It's <laughs> a good answer, it's a good answer. All my... <laughs> You, can, you can't see it, but yes, it is everywhere. Uh, I chose to put it in a few spots. Yeah, so it's, it's essentially, right, as all of the organic matter is breaking down, it's leaching out into the water. So it's, you know, you guys know what it's like. As you take upper level courses, you learn those nice little things you learned about in lower level courses or like generalities, not true all the time. Same thing with the food web. So dissolved organic matter, it's carbon, it's coming out of everywhere. It's coming out of the green food web, it's coming out of the brown food web. It's just there, right? So the dissolved organic matter is leaching out of any of the um, organic matter that's breaking down. So, um, of course, the uh, alloctinous stuff over here, uh, but even the, the producers, right? Even the, even the algae, the paraphyton, um, that's going to be leaching out dissolved organic matter. So it's entering the, our ecosystem from all sorts of different ways. 
And uh, so we talked the other day. So, so where does a lot of it get taken up? Say again. So yeah, so a lot of it does get absorbed on the clay particles, right? So a fair amount of it does just get absorbed on the clay particles. And that can be a big chunk of it. But that that actually finds its way into our food web, how's it going to find its way into the food web? Yeah, microorganism. So where does it go? Funny story. Who was it? Oh, I think it was Olivia. Um, was saying, you know, where does it come from? Where does it go? Literally, the last night at home, something came up. And I said, where does it come from? And my daughter said, where does it go? And talked about the Cotton Eye Joe song. And I said, that's so weird because yesterday in stream ecology, the same thing happened. So here's a little study that um, tried to kind of track that. So they were looking at a couple streams in Coweta Hydrologic Laboratory, which is near um, this Graham, Graham County, further west in North Carolina. And so they did this little study where they uh, excluded terrestrial leaf input from one section of stream and not from the other. And so this is what it looks like. So think of these streams as like the bent creeks of the world, essentially, right? These small Appalachian headwater streams. So they, you know, they measured a whole bunch of stuff about these two different streams. But really, the main thing to note is that looking at leaf litter um, and then FBOM, what do you think FBOM? Well, you could look it up fine benthic organic matter. And so they looked at uh, the section where they'd excluded litter and where their reference was. And so you got to do this to make sure that your experimental manipulation actually worked. And in fact, there was a lot more leaf litter and fine benthic particulate stuff in the reference than when it was excluded. So there's a lot less of uh, the leaf derived organic matter in the experimentally manipulated stream. So manipulative, some scientists. Pretty much. Well, they put up, they put up these uh, like stakes along the side of the stream with netting. So it, right. So dissolved stuff certainly got in. And some other stuff got in too. <laughs> they didn't keep it all out. But they certainly, yeah. So you wouldn't say they completely, probably I wouldn't say excluded. I'd probably say uh, greatly decreased. <laughs> Um, and then they introduced radioactively, and this is where Spider-Man comes into the story. No, they introduced radioactively labeled dissolved organic carbon. Uh, now this is uh, radioactivity that breaks down very quickly, so it doesn't persist in the ecosystem. But they use this to trace uh, where and when it's taken up by organisms. So you can literally use like a Geiger counter to look at uh, organisms and see how much of this organically of this radioactively labeled stuff they've taken, they've taken up. Okay, so first they looked at um, benthic organic matter and ceston. What is ceston again? Yeah, floating in the water. Right? So we've got the benthic organic matter uh, and the ceston in the, in, in the water column. So, um, so this is the ceston. This, this is the water column here. This is the benthic stuff here, all right? And it's a bit confusing, but essentially when this drops, that indicates that the radioactively labeled stuff is taken up. So this is where they introduced the radioactively labeled dissolved organic carbon. And you look at the isotopic ratio of the, um, uh, of, here we are, the FBOM, essentially shallow and deep. And that DOC was being taken up really quickly, like within like 10 meters almost. So essentially this dissolved organic carbon where it was excluded was taken up really rapidly. So it was being taken up by um, well, it was being found on this organic matter. Now, do you think it was the peanut butter or the crackers that were taking up the dissolved organic matter? The peanut butter, of course. Yeah, because that those are the microbes. Those are what make the leaves nutritious. They're the ones that are taking it up, right? So it's not really the, the, the organic matter. The organic matter is dead, right? The FPOM, it's, it's dead. But 
with the microbial community on these uh, pieces, we're sucking up that dissolved organic carbon super quick when leaves were excluded. So they were really looking to pull that stuff out of the water. So they took up more dissolved organic carbon and litter excluded streams. What about the Seston? Was it taking up much of this stuff? It, it, so this, this drop is the change in isotopic ratio, which means that that stuff is showing up. Um, so yes, yeah, so it wasn't happening so much. So the bacteria take this up really quickly. Um, and importantly, to thinking about how stream ecosystems work, a lot more was removed in the benthic than the pelagic microbes, which kind of makes sense, right? It's a headwater stream. We can't, we can't really have a true planktonic community because it's they're washing downstream, right? So it just shows that when the dissolved organic carbon enters these systems, it has to come in contact with the bottom, right? That benthic compartment is really what's going to be responsible for processing that energy. <clears throat> okay. Let's see a couple of folks still taking notes. But yeah, so the main point here is that it was taken up really rapidly and more so on the benthos than in the pelagic. Um, so th that was the FPO. I'm looking at the rock biofilm. Uh, it was a similar thing. The carbon was definitely being taken up. Um, again, this is so this is the isotopic ratio to begin with, and it dropped really, really rapidly, um, pretty quickly. So uh, the biofilm was both on the rocks as well as on this particulate matter were taking up that dissolved organic carbon pretty quickly and more rapidly when there was litter excluded. So what does that tell you about the source of dissolved organic carbon if it's being taken up a lot more quickly in streams that have litter excluded? So in other words, like when we talk about like biological processes, we often find that there's one limit, like the, the, the concept of like a limiting reactant, right? Like if you got in chemistry and stuff, right? There's a scarce reactant that's often needed. Like we talked about limiting nutrients as well, right? So the fact that it's being taken up more quickly in the litter excluded streams just tells you that leaf litter is a pretty uh, is is a pretty uh, significant source of dissolved organic carbon because there was DOC coming in certainly from rain that was washing it in from the landscape and things like that, but this is some evidence that in these headwater streams, those leaves are providing a lot of the DOC and that gets sucked up onto that, those biofilms pretty quickly because they're never going to look at a leaf again the same way I tell you. Um, CPOM though, interestingly, there was not. Uh, as much of a difference um, any ideas why thinking remembering that it's the the, the the microbes that are doing this and this was they had a bit of conjecture about why this was the case where do you think there's a, a more well established microbial community on the CPOM or the FPOM? So think of it as like a time progression. <laughs> so like a time. So when the CPOM has been in long enough, there will be a lot. But that FPOM has been in that stream longer just by virtue of the fact that it's been broken down more. So there were more, uh, more um, well-established microbial communities on the rocks and on the FPOM then on the CPOM, just because the CPOM hadn't been in there as long. So um, yeah, so the idea was that more um, more bio, more time led to more microbial biomass, <clears throat> and so that sort of took it up faster. <clears throat> you know what? We're actually gonna gonna move by that. Um, Yeah, I'm debating how much I want to go into this. Um, but so, so 
So what do y'all think is going on here? So these are the um, the shredding stoneflies. Uh, this is essentially the signature of the DOC that they put in. And then these dots are the isotopic signatures for the stoneflies. And essentially, the lower the signature gets, the closer the isotopic signature of these stoneflies is to the labeled carbon. Any, any thoughts on what they might have concluded from this graph? Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah, so initially, so yeah, right, so if we look at our trend, if we were to just take kind of the average uh, of these, it's certainly higher than down here. So remember that our, my, our microbes took that DOC up in like the first 10 meters or so, right? Okay, those invertebrates though, they don't really uh, match up with the signature until a little bit later, so 10 to 20, even down towards 35, and here <clears throat> down to 40. But there's not really a whole lot of a difference between litter excluded and reference. Um, so, so it's interesting. And these being the shredders, I think what's probably going on here is that they're feeding on the CPOM, which didn't take up as much of it. So if you look at this trend here, there's really not that, that much of a difference here. This year, so this is something. Sorry, yeah, that I should have clarified my axes. This is the um, the isotopic signature of the shredders. Yeah, yeah. So, so I think that. The take home message is, you know, here at zero to 10 meters, you know, some of these shredders matched it up, some didn't. But by the time you got down 10 to 20 to 20 to 35, you know, they'd assimilated it. So I don't know. I, yeah. I guess, I don't know. I don't know how interesting this is. I think maybe, maybe I didn't need to include this. I have been too much stuff. But anyway, the, the main point is that the, the, the invertebrate community, as you might expect, is just taking a little bit longer uh, to assimilate than the, the microbes did. And these guys, of course, are feeding on the, the CPOM, which wasn't really incorporating a lot of the OM anyway. Anyway. Uh, yes, excellent. Yeah, thanks for reminding us. Yeah, and so the idea is if they're getting most of their energy from the microbes, then if the microbes were really incorporating the DOC, then you'd expect that to show up in their bodies. Yeah. Um, all right, I'm gonna jump jump past then, past this. So thinking about how this moves up, right? Another thing just to, just to keep in mind is that in very large rivers, there can be a strong component of, um, of, uh, of planktonic microbes that can take up this, this DOM and, but, in these small streams, not so much. So, um, you know, we do have heterotrophic bacteria um, that are going to be getting, you know, so they have to get their carbon from somewhere else because they're heterotrophs. Um, they can get that from DOC, from DOC in the water column. But um, generally, again, like with rivers and streams, not so important. But here in some place like the Mississippi, um, you know, the pelagic food web is going to be important. So just to review, then we talked about this biofilm and the idea that, um, that, uh, the DOM is being taken up by, uh, by microbes, things like uh, fungal hyphae, by bacteria, all these kinds of things. And uh, there's this sort of like symbiosis going on where they're taking up the nutrients. Uh, and the heterotrophs are getting in more carbon and producing waste for all these algae and then algae are photosynthesizing. So this is what was happening right on that CPOM on those rocks. Right, we've got this kind of biofilm going on. But... The big question then was like, what happens to that productivity then, right? So if DOM is this huge source of carbon, um, you know, and some of it gets taken up by microbes, you know, where does that go? So we have, you know, simplified cartoon. We've got kind of a green food web here. We've got the DOM coming out. 
then that DOM gets taken up by bacteria, and then this is kind of uh, like the biofilm. Right? We've got these microbes. And so these microbes just kind of cycle energy locally. The idea is, so we've got bacteria that take up the dissolved organic matter. They're consumed um, by some of these other microbes. So these are like, like protozoans, like you might have seen, you know, seen under a microscope. All these little tiny microscopic things are feeding on each other, and then their waste you know, provides food. So the idea is there might just be this, this kind of self-contained ecosystem in the biofilm, which we call the microbial loop. And so the question was, like, does this energy find its way back into what we might call like the macro food web, right? Like, like the food web that has our invertebrates, things we can see, essentially. So what happens to this microbial production? Well, so if we want to look at some pictures, we've got bacteria, protozoans. So they're just kind of all feeding on each other. What happens? So there are these organisms called myofauna. What, what does myo mean, like in this spelling? You know, it means kind of like the middle, essentially, like in between, right? You've got micro, macro, meso, myo, it's kind of in the middle. So these are consumers that can bridge the gap. They can consume the microbial biomass, and then they themselves are eaten by bigger stuff. So the energy can move on up. Um, and so these are things that um, some of them can include really uh, tiny insect larvae. So um, this is, anybody know what uh, larva this is? I think we saw some of them in lab. It is a diptera, yeah, it's a diptera. And uh, in particular, it's a, a, a midge larva in the family of Carinomidae. Pretty tiny, and especially when they've just hatched out of the eggs, they're really small. So they can actually feed on those microbes. Uh, but then there are other critters, other organisms. So we saw, we, we probably saw some, well, we definitely saw some, some nematodes. These are just little worms with no segments or anything. They can be quite tiny. They can feed on those microbes and they get fed on by bigger stuff. Rotifers are kind of like super duper small, um, um, Filter feeders, if that makes sense. They kind of live like black fly larvae, but they're even smaller. They're, little, they're tiny little um, uh, they're crustaceans. I'm not actually sure what road, but they're, they have these things called corona, coronas. They're called coronas. Like these little crowns on, that they use to feed uh, and filter stuff out of the water, but really tiny. So the thing is, like in the water column where there are pelagic uh, plankton, you know, of course, we have things like uh, filter feeding fish that swim around in the water that feed on the plankton. And so that's a way that we get that energy into the food web in the pelagic compartment. But on the benthic compartment, we don't have any of those. We've got our filter feeders, but they're not able to get all that stuff. And this is on the, on the, on the bottom of the rock anyway, right? So these are, um, are an important link, right? So those microbes uh, are, are too small for most stuff to feed directly on. Some of it's ingested sort of accidentally. These myofauna are really important. Uh, and then those, um, the myofauna then of course are consumed by the macro fauna, macro invertebrates. So these are predatory invertebrates. I don't think we saw any, um, yeah, we didn't see any hogamites in our sites, did we, in our benthic samples? I don't think, yeah. But they're predatory stoneflies, um, predatory caddisflies. Did we see any, any odonata, any dragonfly or damselfly larva in our, in our samples? Uh, oh, that's the grazer uh, mayfly. Use that to scrape algae off rocks. Yeah, I don't think we, I think we saw one in our fish sampling. I remember pointing out a couple, but I don't think we saw any. So we didn't see a lot of the predators, but of course invertebrates can be predators as well. Um, so anyway, and so then they move on up the food web uh, from there. So, um, so the myofauna are like this kind of missing link between the microbial food web, the microbial loop as it's called, uh, and the rest of the food web. Yeah. That's a really good question. And... Um, 
Yeah, I'm, I'm thinking to myself that this would have been a great lecture actually to bring in some stable isotope analysis, which I should have done. But you, you can kind of get at where um, at where organisms get their 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 nutrients from by looking at like the isotope ratio. So, for instance, um, yeah, species that feed lower. So something that feeds on plant production is going to have a very low um, nitrogen ratio in their, in their tissue because nitrogen gets enriched as it moves up the food web. So when we look at like the stable isotope ratio of central stone rollers, it's just a little bit above algae, which says that it gets most of its energy from algae, but not all of it. And so, um, uh, yeah, and so whether that's microbes or macroinvertebrates, there's actually a study out in Kansas that looked at stone roller diets and Sometimes they eat bugs too, <laughs> but they eat more algae than any other species does. So, but that's a really good question because the idea is, yeah, if the microbe community is a lot more nutritious than algae and the shredders are getting most of their energy, you know, from the microbes, uh, then maybe grazers do as well. And to be honest, I have been an interesting thing to look at. Um, Yeah, I don't. I so they get a fraction of it from from my, from the the microbes, but from what I've seen, their diet seems to be predominantly algae, more algae than other species would be. But I don't know. It could be an undergraduate research project trying to figure that thing out. Um, yeah. Okay. So so the macroinvertebrate feeding roles, then you can see, are real important for moving energy around. From place to place, seeing how it's how it's processed, um, and so that is the benthic microbial loop where the myofauna transform. They're feeding on the rocks, they're, and then they they move it on up from the macroinvertebrates. Now, in the pelagic microbial loop, that is where our friends the black fly larvae uh, come in, as well as freshwater mussels. Although the crazy thing. You guys, this is the thing though. So these black fly larvae live for like less than a year and then they emerge as winged adults, right? They're doing a similar thing ecologically to um, these freshwater mussels. But freshwater mussels can live for decades. So just think about like the fate of that energy. What do you think? is going to be different in a food web where these are the filter feeders versus one where these are the filter feeders. Any thoughts? So if we have most of the pelagic uh, filterable carbon particles being taken up by black fly larvae, which are like stuck on rocks, and they are soft bodied and they emerge within a year and turn into adults, right? As opposed to a food web where most of that productivity is getting filtered out by mussels, which have shells and can live for decades. I don't know, like how would those food webs differ? What do you guys think? Fluctuations, yeah, right. So for sure when these all emerge, yeah. When they emerge in that season, this paper talked about a little bit, your filter feeders are gone. All of a sudden, that, that carbon's going downstream instead of being sucked up into the benthic food web, right? Uh-huh. Any other thoughts? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's really, yeah, it's, it's, it's interesting. The whole idea of like how insects have aquatic larvae and the rest of their life cycle is terrestrial is, is really interesting and in how it affects both systems, you know? Yeah, what do you, what do you guys think? How would the, 
how, how would we measure that? Like, let's say we wanted to try to quantify like the rate of like energy processing. Like, how would we quantify that? If we wanted to compare, say, a big sheet of bedrock that's got these stuck all over it versus like a sandy pocket in a pool that's got these, like how would we quantify, or, or yeah, what, what, how might the scale, well, how would you measure like, I don't know how to answer, ask this question, but I, I guess, yeah, like like how, how would you compare the, the ability of these two to process nutrients? What might you need to measure about it? Or to process organic matter? What might you need to measure between those two habitats? So you could definitely do that. You could look at how much seeps through at how at how much they didn't capture. Yeah, you could look at how efficient they are. Yeah. And what might what might what variables might that depend on? So it could depend on their filtering efficiency. What what else might that depend on too? So that's a good point. Yeah, and and to the best of my knowledge, they're both able to get pretty close to the same size particles. Um, in fact, these are kind of funny. They, um, they they filter stuff out with these fans, but then when they're not filtering stuff out, they'll like they'll like do this like body contortion thing and like like rub the rocks where they are to try to like, get stuff off that way too. Um, so, but yeah, I think they, so. They both they can even filter some large bacteria. They can. So you could look at efficiency. So you could do something like, again, if you wanted to, you could release um, radioactive particles. And when I say that, they don't, they don't, they don't persist very long in the, in the environment. But you could say, you know, what percentage of them went past the black fly larva community, or what percentage of them went pa past the mussels. And I think I probably want to measure biomass, like, like. Okay, these are a lot smaller than these, but if there's yeah, a thousand of them in a square meter, maybe it's like a small muscle in a in a square meter, you know. But yeah, it's just so interesting that like all the energy here gets locked away for decades, right? Whereas here, it's it's flowing quickly. It's either going out to the terrestrial zone when it um when they emerge, or it's getting consumed by these are nice and soft bodied, right? They get consumed by invertebrate predators, fish predators, all that kind of stuff. Um, so um, yeah, so it's an interesting to, to think about. Um, all right, so yeah, so I mean, we're, we're still learning about microbial food webs. There's a lot we don't know about them, um, but they're really important. And how that energy moves through the food web is gonna be important too.